great to speak with you today uh, and thank you uh, in advance uh, for taking the time to share your thoughts and experiences as we collectively prepare for uh, the future of philanthropic action and the various strategic dimensions relevant to uh, maximizing impact. Dr. Mass uh, Kropsgaard Thompson is a son of Denmark uh, and the former head of R&D uh, and CSO, the chief scientific officer of the global healthcare company Novo Nordisk, which was founded in uh, 1923 uh, and is headquartered uh, in Denmark. As a leading pharmacologist, uh, Mass was responsible for the research and development of uh, 20 uh, medical uh, products and spearheaded the optimization of insulin analogs that helped uh, Novo Nordisk remain as a top uh, diabetes uh, uh, business with exports to over 180 countries. Mass uh, weathered the biopharmaceutical industry's many waves of change and disruptive mergers and acquisitions for over two decades and has recently assumed the role of CEO of Novo Nordisk Foundation uh, in uh, uh, March 2021. Uh, the Novo Nordisk Foundation is the largest endowment in the world with a net worth of well over $70 billion uh, and operates uh, as an independent foundation that's focused on supporting scientific, humanitarian and social causes, uh, including across many of the so-called uh, emerging markets as well as the overall sustainability of the uh, Novo Group. Throughout uh, Mass's decorated career uh, in uh, academia and business, he served on more than a few prestigious boards, including the Technical University of Denmark, uh, Solartis, uh, Symphogen, uh, and uh, BB Biotech. Uh, he also chaired the boards of the University of Copenhagen uh, and uh, the Steno uh, Diabetes Center. Dear Mass, uh, earlier this year you took over the role of CEO of Novo Nordisk Foundation uh, after many years uh, on the business side uh, of Novo Nordisk. Uh, congratulations. Um, as you embark on this new role uh, in an independent foundation that's proud of its corporate links, how important do you believe the nexus between business and philanthropic capital is? Well, first of all, I, I think it's very important. Uh, you mentioned yourself the development of uh, insulin analogs that have made uh, pharmacotherapy within diabetes uh, more convenient and more safe and more efficacious. And, and I actually believe that the benefit of uh, owning or at least partly owning a company that can invest in new technology while making the uh, last generation technology available at very affordable prices throughout the world and yet retain you can say surplus cash to invest in new innovation. I think there's a really good balance there. So we are now investing in giving back to society some of the profits uh, from the operating companies in ways that actually uh, both within human health care, but also I would say global health and sustainability are, are really meaningful. So it's been a jump from making just medicines to, to a more broad societal impact, which I find extremely rewarding. Your distinguished career spans an impressive track record in the field of medical research uh, and the Novo Nordisk Foundation has been very active uh, in the ongoing fight uh, against the COVID-19 pandemic. You donated uh, many mi millions of dollars for COVID-related measures, test centers, uh, and funded research trials for anti-inflammatory drugs. Do you think the pandemic is changing people's perception of the role of private philanthropic capital in helping communities respond to this sort of uh, emergency? Yes, I think at least from where I'm coming in, in Little Denmark, uh, public-private partnerships, including those with the philanthropy, have really been now on the radar screen in a positive way among, for instance, the political establishment. So both the philanthropy where, where the Nunoz Foundation funded um, many test centers throughout Denmark for COVID-19 testing, but also the operating company actually developed the technology, the PCR technology that was then used nationwide. Uh, it's really an example of philanthropy, uh, the public system, and even the operating companies coming together in a way that has created, I, I think, a more justified and, and, and good image of what it actually is we, we are able to do in, in our side of, you can say, uh, the business of the world. Emerging markets uh, occupy the top 30 
uh, list of the fastest growing economies in the world, uh, and the majority of uh, new wealth is being generated within these regions, uh, including across parts of Africa, the Middle East, and uh, developing Asia. Uh, as a European organization uh, deeply engaged in many of these markets, have you observed the, the nature and attitudes of philanthropy changing in these regions of the world uh, over time? And if so, what do you believe are the main drivers of uh, this change? Well, well, first of all, it's a very good point you're making that these uh, emerging market economies, due to their relatively uh, very strong growth, it suddenly, first of all, becomes more feasible to do meaningful philanthropy because infrastructure is built, uh, education within healthcare is enhanced, and suddenly it becomes possible to do things where, for instance, uh, diseases get, get diagnosed and can get meaningful uh, treatment. Uh, it also becomes easier to help when there's unrest in the country as they become more and more established uh, economies uh, with, with the possibility also to make sure that your money and, and your funding and, and your support goes the, to the correct places, so to speak. So I, I've, during my 30 years tenure at Nordos, I've witnessed that our ability as a company, but also now in the foundation, to operate more broadly in these uh, countries, in these emerging markets, has expanded vastly, uh, in particular also over the last decade or so. So, so it's important actually to reach out early on and make, you know, uh, for instance, pharmacotherapy is affordable at a point and, and, and accessible at a point in time where they're, they're very immature. And then over time, the societies mature due to financial growth and, and strength. And suddenly they can also become an integral part of the more modern healthcare systems that we know from, from the Western world. So I've seen that happening and, and we've tried to contribute also via the World Diabetes Foundation and so on, the best that we could. Your work at the foundation is closely tied to uh, data and uh, evidence-informed grant giving. Uh, in your view, Mas, how can we ensure that this new generation of philanthropists uh, across these growth markets, but globally really, have access to the tools and knowledge that they will need to maximize their impact? I think that is a very important question because um, to me, everything has to be uh, evidence-based as we roll out uh, things. Uh, so if you take a thing like bioagriculture, the ability to not have to cut down the Amazonas or to have to use all water for watering purposes on the fields, but by actually having healthier crops in a biologically reasonable way and so on and so forth, that, that is an example of a thing we need to do data-based. I can mention many others. So, so even though we can do wonderful philanthropy in Denmark and show that it works here in our little kingdom, it's actually important to have the evidence base to show that when research points to new ways of farming, doing agriculture, whatever it may be, they also have to prove themselves out there in the local environments. And this is why we, we're extremely evidence based and, and we even would like to share data. So when, when we talk to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and so on, we actually are preoccupied by the idea of sharing data so that we can generate more knowledge together and also avoid that we duplicate uh, efforts of each other. Yeah, that's so important. And we're seeing that, um, I mean, with so many of the conversations we're having, that seems to be a common theme that's coming out, which I think is very promising. Uh, as a sort of follow on uh, question, um, how, how is technology, broadly speaking, and innovation changing philanthropy to uh, meet Unful unfulfilled healthcare needs in the regions that you're active in? So, so for us, it has changed um, uh, quite a lot technology because uh, over the past years, a couple of things have become painfully evident. One is the global climate change that will as, or actually also hit some of the emerging markets uh, rather hard if we don't uh, act against them now. But, but in general, technologies uh, have emerged over the last decade that make a lot of the previous insights on the human genome, on the genome of plants, uh, on whatever it may be, carbon capture and so on, <clears throat> things have become more accessible to scaling up to industrial scale so that we're starting to be able also to use, for instance, um, high performance computing, maybe even quantum computing in, in modeling of the future uh, weather forecast of the global global climate in the future ability to understand microbiome populations in our guts and so on. We, we today don't have the computational power 
to make all the technologies really uh, reach their max potential. But we are, we are emerging with these technologies, both in the climate area, in human health, in computing, that will help us get there, I think, by around 2030. So we are investing rather heavily in some of these technologies by creating research centers that are dedicated either to bioagriculture, to quantum computing, to carbon emission, carbon capture, and, and things like that. No, Bernadisk has long been open to partnerships. Uh, you just talked about that. Um, and I guess with the objective of ensuring equitable uh, access to healthcare uh, within the WHO framework. As we embark uh, on this decade of delivery that we just talked about to meet the world's uh, SDGs, do you believe that the pandemic uh, will have a lasting impact on how people think about the imperative for multi-stakeholder collaboration and true partnerships? Uh, I, I hope so. I sincerely hope so, because what has been painfully evident also during the pandemic is that just like we have built a, a network within a non-communicable disease called type 2 diabetes in many emerging markets of the world, making infrastructure uh, uh, activities possible such that, that you know, remedies and therapies can get out to the population. We've seen during COVID-19 that, uh, and the WHO can testify to this, that just getting the vaccines out there and, and, and do the job of vaccinating local populations has been a, a huge dilemma. And very often the data infrastructure and the logistics have simply not been in place. So there's a lot of ongoing efforts between WHO and the UN system and some of the big foundations uh, and trusts to, to try to actually make ourselves more prepared for, for the next round. And luckily we now have the technologies uh, talking about technology, the mRNA technology has actually, and a couple of others, have actually revolutionized our ability to counteract pandemics like COVID-19 in a way that is unforeseen. Now we just need to get the global outreach and systems uh, up and running in, in, in a way that we're better prepared next time. So final question, if I may. Um, is, is there an ideal or optimal role for private philanthropy in the field of medical research? And for philanthropists who might be watching this, who are interested in focusing their efforts in this field, what advice would you give them? I, I think that's a huge place, a huge place. Um, uh, because in, in, in all honesty, if you take the private companies, the pharmaceutical industry, they are very often focused on the more established paradigms uh, and, and universities are not really focused on translating basic research into applied science. So I think one of the roles that, that private philanthropy can play and, and Novo Nordisk Foundation is playing in a big scale through a number of research centers at universities um, already today is to bridge, you can say, um, from basic research through translation into something that can become remedies of the future, help both with the funding, but also with the translation into something that just doesn't become a publication in the Nature Journal or somewhere else, but actually moves all the way. So I think we, we can help the whole life science ecosystem come together from the very early stages of basic research to the later stages of applied research translation and, and even into the marketplace by, by facilitating and catalyzing that, that this whole value chain is, is you know, passed through. That's great advice uh, that I'm sure many will make uh, good use of. Uh, thank you, uh, Mass, for uh, all the phenomenally important work that uh, you continue to do, uh, and of course, for taking the time to share your uh, great uh, insights with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day.